just check in this works good welcome everyone we'll get started thank you for coming today um for those of you who don't know me i'm jen brett i'm an assistant professor of pulmonary and critical care medicine uh, and i'm proud to introduce uh, this year's uh, jerome flance lecture each year we honor dr flance uh, in his contributions to pulmonary medicine by hosting a distinguished physician to share expertise in the science of lung disease. So for a little history about Dr. Flance himself, um, his initial contributions to medicine began in, with the establishment of the home care uh, program for tuberculosis patients in 1953. He subsequently received multiple accolades for his clinical excellence. And this coincided with the establishment of the Flance Lecture, as well as the Selden and Flance Professorships. After his retirement in 1998, uh, he dedicated his work to social justice in the community, including the revitalization of the Forest Park Southeast neighborhood, the establishment of the Flance Early Learning Center, and the Graceville Neighborhood Clinic, where I did my resident, uh, my resident clinic when I was a resident here. I'd also like to give you a flavor for the legacy that has come since uh, Jerry Flance's time. So the pioneering vision and contribution to Dr. Flance have really fueled a lasting legacy of pulmonary clinical medicine, education, and research. Our clinical growth has included multiple centers of excellence, the Lung Center, and one of the world's largest transplant programs, which was established by our recent Flance professor, Dr. Albert Trulock. The division was first awarded an NHLBI training grant in 1977, and our Selvin professor, Dr. Michael Holtzman, sustain this educational support for decades as division chief. Our faculty have contributed major advances in the science of lung disease, including mechanisms of pulmonary emphysema, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, matrix and surfactant biology. Um, and this was done by a number of, uh, of our faculty, but names I'll point out, Jack Pierce, Bob Senior, Eric Crouch, Ed Silverman, Dave Perlmutter, and as I said, many others. Steve Brody has made seminal contributions to airway biology, and Dr. Holtzman has made breakthrough discoveries in virus-induced airway remodeling and drug development to interrupt that process. As a former trainee of Michael Holtzman, now a physician scientist running my own research lab, I look forward with my colleagues to carrying on the legacy of Jerry Flance with our new division chief, Janet Lee. Um, and with that, I'll introduce our Flance lecturer this year, Dr. Malin Han, the Henry Sewell Endowed Professor of Medicine and Chief of Pulmonary Critical Care at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. She received her MD from the University of Washington and completed her medicine residency and pulmonary critical care fellowship at the University of Michigan. She's also received a master's degree in biostatistics and clinical trial design and uh, from the University of Michigan School of Public Health. She's a leading researcher uh, in the, uh, defining the subtypes of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease with major contributions in the utilization of thoracic CT imaging approaches to track disease progression and subtypes. She is the site PI at Michigan for the spiromics and COPD gene, NIH funded cohort studies, which have been incredible resources for those of us studying COPD. I am delighted now to turn over the podium to Dr. Horn. All right. Well, it's a real pleasure to uh, be with all of you uh, today. I was joking. I think the last time I was on campus was when I interviewed for medical school, which was a little while ago. It looks like you've grown and uh, it's just a, an amazing uh, place. And I'm just very, very honored uh, to be here with all of you. So the talk I'm going to give today is a little bit uh, different. And so I hope that uh, you'll, you'll bear with me. Uh, it is really more of a, of a story uh, than it is my typical research talk, but I thought it would have kind of broad appeal for uh, a general audience. So today I'm gonna be talking about, um, about a crisis, about a reckoning, about a story, about sort of what I've learned about lung health uh, in the last two years. It's a little bit of a thought journey um, that I've sort of been on uh, over the last two years, really precipitated by the pandemic. So here, are, uh, there's this disclosure slide, there's 
this disclosure slide. <laughs> so like with all good stories, this story has a beginning. And for me, the beginning of this story was fall of 2019, spring of 2020. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I went into pulmonary medicine in the first place was that I saw that there was uh, a need, a big, a big need from uh, patients uh, for additional care providers. And so advocacy has always been important to me. And I've been a spokesperson for the American Lung Association for perhaps the last 10 years or so. I will tell you that it has traditionally been a fairly sleepy job. Uh, it was a sleepy job until fall of 2019 when the youth uh, vaping uh, epidemic pandemic was really at its peak. If you'll remember, this happened right before COVID. Uh, we had uh, people on ventilators needing lung transplants from E Valley, and there was suddenly kind of there was suddenly a lot of interest into what we were putting on our bodies and what might heart, uh, harm our lungs. Uh, and then the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden, people had lots of questions. And we realized that we really probably hadn't done a good enough job educating the public on how their lungs worked uh, and what mechanical ventilators did and why we needed them and how they worked. And uh, as you can see from these projections, unfortunately, we were woefully off on uh, the projection of the impact uh, of this pandemic. Uh, the White House had projected 100 uh, to 200,000 uh, deaths. I was doing uh, lots of and, and lots of interviews. And I had the opportunity to do an interview with a podcast you may have heard of, uh, Freakonomics. Uh, and I was uh, you know, able to explain how mechanical, uh, mechanical ventilators work and, and why they worked. Uh, and this actually ultimately uh, led to uh, me having the opportunity to write a book. Uh, about uh, how the lungs work for the lay public. But it was really in the process of writing that book uh, that I sort of kind of came to my current way of thinking uh, about the lungs, lung disease, and, and lung health that I'm going to share with you today. So this is actually a few months old now, but the, but the estimates uh, suggest that probably over 1 million Americans are now dead from COVID-19, way off of the um, uh, original mark. And when you look at what they actually died of, the vast majority died from refractory respiratory failure. Uh, and in fact, in 2021, the American Lung Association reported that for the first time ever, ever lung disease was the number one cause of death uh, in the United States. And so this really got me thinking, how did we get to this place in 2020, in 2021, where we didn't really have any specific treatments for patients with ARDS. We have supportive care, and that's about it. We didn't, we don't really understand how to treat lung failure. Uh, and we really were uh, struggling, struggling to, to figure out how to care for these patients both before, during, and if they survived uh, after. And so it, it really got me thinking, how did we get to this place where we've had so many medical breakthroughs in so many other arenas, but not in pulmonary disease? And so I started going, coming through the literature. I thought, I need to go back to the beginning. You know, where did this all start? How, where, you know, how is it that, that our current understanding of lung disease is what it is? And so I started some of my research with, um, the, with the origins of the modern day spirometer. And so for those of you who don't know, it was actually the, the first machine that looked even close to the machines that we have today. It was developed by a, gen a gentleman named John Hutchinson and he was a, an assessor and physician for the Britannia Life Assurance Company. And, and he, you know, the original machines involved an inverted bell that was in water, the patients would blow in and then you'd measure the amount of water that was displaced uh, by the patient who was uh, uh, blowing out the air. Uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is that the name that he came up with for this volume of air that was displaced, that has stuck and he called it biocapacity. And he called it that because even in 1800s, he had figured out in his role uh, for a life insurance company that vital capacity predicted survival. 
And somehow over the next 200 years, we sort of conveniently forgot about this, forgotten just how important lung function and measuring lung function actually is. And so what I was really curious about as I went back into the medical books is why has cardiovascular disease, the research understanding and development of treatments been so different from, from lung disease? Why, why did these two roads diverge? And so I looked back at, you know, sort of the, the, the cardiovascular equivalent of, 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 uh, of a spirometer, and that would be the blood pressure cuff. And so it turns out it was actually, it, the sigma manometer was actually invented 50 years after uh, the spirometer. But when the physicians finally figured out that you could combine a blood pressure cuff with a stethoscope and it would give you systolic and diastolic blood pressure measurements, it really caught on. Now, the funny thing is this is, you have to remember, this is evidence-free, uh, or sorry, evidence-based medicine-free zone, right? This is uh, the early 1900s. And to be honest, doctors thought it made them look cool. They could put it in their doctor's bag. It was very different than the, the massive spermer that required water and everything else. They could put it in their doctor's bag, waltz into a wealthy client's home, you know, whip this out, show their skill set, and, and get paid well and go home. So it became very, very popular. And it just started getting used. And all of a sudden, we had blood pressure measurements on literally everyone. So fast forward uh, to the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, President Franklin Roosevelt uh, had just been elected to the highest office of our land. And his blood pressure at that time, we knew it. If you look back in the records, it was recorded. It was 140 uh, over 100. And over the next few years, his blood pressure continued to rise and continued to rise until he finally died from a stroke with a blood pressure of 300 over 190. Now, that would never have happened today. But why is it that that would never have happened today? Well, the reason why is because right after the death of FDR, uh, led, uh, the US Congress funded the Framingham Heart Study, which is arguably one of the most important and landmark epidemiologic studies that has ever been conducted. And you know the, the site was chosen because the citizens were amenable and it was close to Harvard. Uh, and, and since then, just think about all of the things that we've learned. We now understand about the importance of obesity and cholesterol and blood pressure. And if you look at this, um, this graphic, which was um, published by Betsy Nabel in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, you can just see over time all of the amazing things that have happened within the field of cardiovascular disease from the onset of statins to understanding about angioplasty, et cetera, et cetera, that have ultimately led to massive reductions in deaths from heart disease and stroke. Now, at the same time, uh, they mentioned earlier, you know, one of the main diseases that I study is, cardi is uh, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. And over time, deaths from COPD have simply continued uh, to go up. Now, I don't think that this is necessarily because COPD has become more deadly uh, over time or that we've gotten that much worse with treating it. But I think it's rather the fact that people are no longer dying of their MIs in their 50s, and now they're living long enough to die of COPD in their 60s or 70s. But it is still no less uh, of a problem and one that we have made so little progress on. And I'll, and I'll take ownership over that, uh, or some of it anyway, as being one of those researchers that's been trying to understand the disease and to find cures. And I think this is really telling. So this is um, uh, data from a pharma report, believe it or not. And it shows the top 25 diseases uh, or indications that, at least this was a few years ago, that were under investigation and the number of drugs that were somewhere in pipeline for pharma companies uh, for various diseases. And if you'll look, you know, what's at the top? Well, cancer's at the top and almost every single spot in the top 10. Uh, and then much lower down, you'll see asthma. And then almost at the bottom, like almost falling off the list is, is COPD. And, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, the way the drugs get developed in this country right now, it's market forces. So they have to be able to show that within a timeline that works for investors, that a drug can impact something that the FDA cares about and then uh, get it approved. And some of the challenges that we've had in respiratory disease and particularly COPD is that it's incredibly heterogeneous. 
patients are diagnosed very, very late at a point where it's difficult to, to show disease modification. It's also very slowly progressive. And the FDA has only been willing to look at FEV1, a measure of lung function as an outcome, as opposed to say CT derived metrics that would be uh, more sensitive. And so it has been a huge struggle. We have not had really, unless you count uh, uh, reflumolast, which is a PD-4 inhibitor, which theophylline also is. So if you count reflumolast as, as a new uh, therapeutic class, we really only had one new therapeutic class uh, for COPD approved in the last 20 years. Uh, and if you look at the R&D pipeline uh, by uh, therapy group, and again, look at the number of drugs in play, you'll see respiratory is down there at the very, very bottom. And if you read the, this uh, pharma report in more detail, it says, that uh, there's actually some hint that some, some things are being you know, pushed out of the way because of, of, of uh, rapid uh, unchecked uh, expansion with respect to cancer. I'm not saying that cancer isn't important. It, it, it clearly is, uh, but we've got very respiratory disease sort of at the very, very bottom. And it isn't just isolated to pharma. When you look at NIH funding, typically, typically burden follows the dollars, dollars follow the burden. Uh, and there is this sort of roughly correlated pattern between US disability adjusted life years and NIH funding, but there are a few exceptions. If you will notice, uh, COPD is way down um, in the right-hand corner. Lung cancer is sort of down there uh, as well. And part of the problem is that uh, both COPD and lung cancer I do have a certain amount of stigma associated with them. Uh, people view these as self-inflicted problems, and so there's a lot less um, public sympathy. Um, but there are examples where um, there's actually been, um, advocacy groups have actually been able to make a dent. And a good example of that is AIDS. So the number of uh, dollars that has gone into that is now you know, higher than perhaps the uh, global disease burden, uh, but it's because of inroads that, that various advocacy groups have had to, to improve funding. So I think that there, that there, there is the potential, there's the possibility that we could uh, bend this curve, but it, if, if ever we needed investments in lung disease, I would say that time is now. So as was mentioned earlier, and these are my, I've got like five or six slides on COPD that I put in here because that is, that is my home base, that is what I study. And a lot of my efforts most recently have been uh, looking into early lung disease, um, but it is relevant to this talk. So if you look at the number of individuals in the US that have uh, undiagnosed uh, COPD, uh, it's it's rough. We estimate roughly 30 million Americans are living with COPD, and probably only 15 million Americans uh, are are diagnosed. And I would ultimately argue, as it relates to the pandemic, I think that there was probably a lot of underlying undiagnosed lung disease that contributed to the large amount of heterogeneity uh, that we saw with respect to COVID severity and 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 COVID uh, and COVID deaths. Uh, one of the problems that we've had is that uh, we can, as a medical community, we can't even agree on whether uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is something that we should screen for. I think in my lifetime, at least in the last maybe 15 years, that we've just had the third uh, publishing of the same document. U.S. Preventive Services Task Force reaffirms their original recommendation statement that we shouldn't be screening for uh, COPD. And, and the argument has been and remains uh, that there is no evidence suggesting that if we were to identify these patients early, that we would have disease modifying treatments that would ultimately impact outcome. But it's important to remember that this recommendation is based on lack of evidence and not negative evidence. It's also in, in my mind become the sort of chicken and egg vicious cycle problem where there's no recommendation that we should screen. Patients get picked up really late. By the time they get into clinical trials, it's like, it's like trying to prevent soil erosion when most of the land's already gone, right? So we're gonna have a very difficult time showing that we can slow loss of lung function to uh, of lung function when most of the lung function's already gone by the time we get them into clinical trials. And then the US Preventive Services Task Force comes out again and says there's just no evidence that, that, we, that we can do anything. And it just doesn't stop. It's, it, we have to figure out a way to stop the cycle. Now, one of the things that uh, 
uh, I've been involved with, I'm on the uh, International Gold Committee that helps to write some of the management strategies for COPD on an international level. And when I first uh, graduated from fellowship, there actually was this category we called Gold Zero. It doesn't even exist anymore. But at the time, there was this category called Gold Zero. And it was patients that were at risk for disease, but still had normal spirometry, but they had symptoms. And the thought was, well, these patients who are symptomatic may go on to develop airflow obstruction as defined by spirometry. And so therefore we should be thinking about them and um, we should consider treating them. Uh, and, but having said that, they ultimately got rid of the designation because uh, studies that came out after this original publication suggested that while there is an association between symptoms and developing disease, the vast majority of people who ultimately get disease didn't necessarily have symptoms. And so it wasn't clear that this was a good marker for identifying uh, who should go on for additional study. And so therefore the designation was dropped. However, due to some NIH funded studies such as COPD gene and spiromics, we now have gotten data on a lot of smokers, symptom data, physiologic data, CT data. And we now know that smokers who do not meet our current criteria for COPD still have abnormalities. And we just don't know what to call it, what to do with it, or even how to you know, make a recommendation on routinely finding it. But we know they've got symptoms, they've got clinical impairments, they're having exacerbations, they've got CT abnormalities. And whether they do or don't have airflow obstruction, these patients have, have morbidity and probably need to be recognized in their own right. This is some data that was uh, generated from COPD gene, just looking at uh, CT abnormalities. And uh, when you look at things like emphysema, gas trapping, and then you add in airway wall thickening, roughly 42% of smokers, regardless of symptoms, had some evidence of CT abnormality. Uh, there was also roughly a quarter of those patients, if you use the MMRC dyspnea scale, roughly a quarter of those patients uh, had symptoms as compared to only about 4% of never smokers. So there's clearly disease burden even beyond what we're catching uh, with spirometry. This is data that uh, came out of the spiromic study that was published back in the New England Journal back in 2016. Uh, but uh, essentially we had a very, very simple question and that is, what do I know about these patients that do not meet our criteria for COPD but have symptoms? And what we found is that no matter what definition for exacerbation or flare up of disease that you used, those symptomatic people had the same or relatively the same number of exacerbations or flare-ups as uh, patients who met criteria for airflow obstruction, which, is, which are over here on the right. So these patients here looked very similar to these patients, regardless of lung function, which I think was sort of a, a, one of the first hints that our definition for COPD probably needs to be re-examined. Some further evidence uh, for this and for some path actual pathology in this group came from this follow-up study that we also, that the Spermis group also published in the New England Journal. And what we looked at there was sputum. We looked at sputum use and concentrations in particular. And what we were able to demonstrate was that uh, in general, patients who complained about cough and phlegm had higher mucin concentrations. Uh, the more the severe dis the disease got, the higher the mucin concentrations got. The more flare-ups patients had, the higher the mucin concentrations got. And if you looked at these smokers who had symptoms but didn't meet criteria for airflow obstruction, they also had higher mucin concentrations, suggesting likely that some type of airway pathology was present that we are not currently capturing uh, with, uh, with spirometry, which is currently our gold standard for diagnosing COPD. So there have been a lot of publications just in the last year trying to figure out how to grapple with this. We at Gold are trying to grapple with this, but we did sort of propose a potential new definition for what we're calling pre-COPD. Uh, there's pre-diabetes, there's pre-hypertension, but I will tell you, we as pulmonologists are really, really cautious, uh, a bit to our own detriment, uh, and so just trying to even come up with a, a definition that we felt confident about raised all sorts of arguing with, with some people saying, no, we just need to, we just need to do it. We've got to raise awareness. And others of us saying, well, we're, I'm, we're, I'm just not sure. What about the extra anxiety we'll cause? We, again, still don't have treatments. What are we going to tell people to do with this information?
Uh, but ultimately we decided, well, if you've got symptoms, we knew that was important, but also if you had CT abnormality, we think that's important. And then there's also some subtle abnormalities on pulmonary function that may not meet our criteria, current criteria for airflow obstruction. That's probably also important, but it's, this is definitely an area where we need more long-term data to be able to refine uh, some of these cut points. So I told you I thought this was relevant, though, to our current discussion, this, this idea that there's all of these patients, I think, uh, that we've got out there either with actual lung disease who aren't diagnosed or some version of inflammation or lung injury that doesn't even meet criteria for uh, lung disease. And, and as we started to roll through the pandemic, the evidence that this was the case, at least for me, started to kind of uh, tick up. And so I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. So one of the studies that came out during the pandemic that was of incredible interest to me was this one. And it related, if you remember, in uh, we had a lot of wildfires uh, in the American West uh, during the pandemic. And there was a study out of Harvard where they looked at uh, three of the states that had been most impacted. They looked at a very specific uh, 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 time and looked at the association between exposure to fine particulate matter and COVID-19. Now we knew even before the pandemic that there was a relationship to air pollution and increased susceptibility to airborne infections, but never before had we had an exposure, wildfires, a virus that everyone was tracking to this extent, uh, COVID, and the ability to uh, measure morbidity and mortality related to those um, two specific events. And what they found was that wildfires ampl um, amplified the effect of the exposure of PM 2.5 on COVID-19 cases and deaths up to four weeks after the exposure. And they found a roughly 12% increase in COVID-19 cases and an 8% increase in COVID-19 uh, deaths. So to me, this was really, really interesting evidence that underlying lung inflammation, in this case related to air pollution, but it could be anything. It might even be things going on in people's homes that we're not even uh, aware of. So underlying lung inflammation increased susceptibility to COVID-19. Then there was this study, which actually came out of uh, the University of Michigan by some of my colleagues in uh, pathology. And what they did was to take a series of cases for patients that had COVID-19 uh, and they that had had open lung biopsies. And they went back and they uh, outlined what kind of abnormality that, that they found. Uh, but the interesting thing is they then went back and looked at some of the patient's history. They went back and looked at charts if the patients had had CT scans before, uh, before COVID-19. And what they found was for that the patients who had the worst pathologic abnormality, which for us is usual interstitial pneumonia pattern uh, on biopsy, for the patients that had this worst pattern, uh, they uh, had evidence of, many of them had evidence of uh, brown glass opacities with interstitial thickening or reticulations and brachiectasis even before they were diagnosed with COVID-19. And some of the, many of these patients didn't even really know. I mean, think about how many times you've ordered a CT scan or seen someone that's kind of breezed through the emergency room and to let's say get a renal, you know, they've got a kidney stone or something like that. And they catch the bottom of the lungs and something is, is mentioned. There's some uh, bronchiolitis, there's some interstitial abnormality, there's some cysts. Uh, and I mean, we as pulmonologists just know because we see this all the time, these patients, nobody, pays attention, it just kind of gets lost in the record. And then 10 years later, they show up really sick on your doorstep and you start digging through the record and you say to them, did anybody mention to you that you had these abnormalities on your, you know, the little bit of lungs that happened to have gotten caught on the CT scan 10 years ago, it happens all the time. And I think that again, the amount of disease uh, burden that's out there that is unrecognized that came to light because of uh, the pandemic is much more vast than we ever realized. Some of the other information that's really impacted my thinking on this was this paper published by Peter Langa in the New England Journal in 2015. I know most of the pulmonologists in the room probably are familiar with this, but for those of you who, who are not, or maybe haven't seen this figure before, um, for us, this was really paradigm shifting 
so you know how many how many people remember the Fletcher Pedo curve from medical school, right? Most of us did, and so that's been the mantra, right, for forever. You everybody gets to adulthood with relatively normal lungs. Something bad happens. They smoke, et cetera. They have accelerated lung function decline. We've all learned that. That that's the way it happens, right? Well, the data from this particular study suggested, well, if what they did is they combined, this is the problem, we don't get pulmonary function data in early life, we don't get it in adulthood. So the only place to get information like this is cohort studies. So in this particular study, they added together data from three, um, three, I never know where to point, three cohort studies. And they ultimately figured out of the people who got COPD, half got it from the route that we would have normally thought. Normal lung function in adulthood, see 100% predicted rapid lung function decline in uh, afterwards due to some noxious exposure. But the interesting thing is if you look at the black line, half of those people didn't get COPD because they had some, they didn't fit that fletcher pedo model. They didn't have accelerated lung function decline in adulthood. What they had was failure to reach peak lung function in early adulthood, which means that for a significant percentage of the population, something is going wrong in either in utero or during childhood to impact them to the point that they aren't get, having uh, peak lung function uh, in adulthood. I mean, to me, this, this information is somewhat, somewhat mind blowing. I mean, we don't talk about this, right? How many of us actually, you know, think about the fact that half, you know, that many patients are just walking around with, with abnormal lung function and, and they have no idea. And, and while again, U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and 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 many of the um, you know bodies that suggest about you know which screening tests we should do, et cetera, have argued, well, there's nothing that we would do. I'm not 100% sure that doesn't mean that patients wouldn't do something different, right? So, if you, I recently saw a gentleman uh, in my office who uh, had probably had bronchopulmonary dysplasia from childhood, uh, never really knew about it, uh, you know grew up, started smoking, vaping in high school, like many, many teenagers do, and then came into my office when he was around 20, and he couldn't breathe, and he couldn't keep up with his friends playing basketball, and it, I have to believe that if he had known that he was reaching, you know, puberty and early adulthood with such significantly impaired lung function, he might have made different life choices, uh, and about how he would choose to protect his lungs moving forward. And so I was kind of so moved and sort of disturbed by all of this information that I had gathered for the book um, that I had written this op-ed uh, in the LA Times in um, not too long ago, a little over a year ago, with just this concept that even before the pandemic, we had a crisis on our hands with the number of people that were even either reaching adulthood with abnormal lungs or patients that in adulthood had some level of lung inflammation or lung disease that were simply going unchecked, unnoticed, untreated, and very little treatments uh, in the pipeline for the lung diseases that we do have. And so it further made me think about how did we get here exactly? Why is it that we're here like this in, in 2023 now? And I was reminded by one of the sort of the giants of, of of pulmonary medicine who had written an editorial several years back. Um, this was an editorial written uh, by a gentleman who some consider sort of the father of modern day pulmonary medicine, Tom Petty. And he had written an editorial and he referred to this cartoon um, from the, from, you know, the, uh, that uh, no longer is is in print, but when we had newspapers and they had cartoons, this was uh, the name of this uh, cartoon is uh, called Pogo, and it was about a little a little possum and his friends that roamed around the Okefenokee Swamp, and and uh, Dr. Petty in his editorial referred to this particular cartoon where they're they're roaming around and they're like, gosh, why is there all this trash? Why is it so? Why is this the swamp look so bad? And, and, and Pogo says, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, and so in reference to the pulmonary community and how it is that we got where we are today, I think we as a pulmonary community, and I'll throw myself in that bucket, have to take some responsibility for the fact that we have so shrouded spirometry in mystery and held it to such high standards that nobody uses it. So if you think about blood pressure measurements, what are you supposed to do to get a good blood pressure measurement? A patient's supposed to sit in a quiet room for 10 minutes 
you get three, you know, if you're doing it per clinical trial, you have to get like three measurements and measure the best, right? But nobody ever does that. What we do is we make them cheap, widely available, and patients just get 100 measurements at home. And then we, we kind of look at the trend and then we decide, okay, yeah, you probably really do have something and we probably should get you started on something, right? But we've taken a very different approach with spirometry. We want perfect numbers. So we do them in pulmonary function testing labs with and there's very strict reproducibility criteria and only trained people can do the test. And that's great because the numbers are really, really good, except for nobody does them then, right? And then we don't, we have all these patients walking around with no, with no information. We didn't have the data to demonstrate that blood pressure was a good idea when we started doing it. Uh, but, but now, now we've sort of kind of roped ourselves, roped ourselves in, and we're, we simply just have a lot of patients, I think, who don't know that they have impaired lung function. We don't use spirometry enough. So knowing that, um, you know, I'm going to spend the last few minutes of my talk uh, just talking about where I think we need to go as a medical community now. How do we, how do we win this game? I'm an adult pulmonologist, and I've spent most of my life thinking about about adults. And, um, and what we need to do to try to help protect and treat adults. But if we ultimately want to win this game, we're gonna have to go back much further into the life course and start thinking about even adult lung disease as a lifelong problem and start thinking about what happens in utero and start thinking about what happens uh, to children and figure out not how just to protect individuals, but what are some of the societal measures that are gonna have to go into place um, to preserve lung health over the life course. So in thinking about this, there, I, I, break, I break it into kind of three different buckets. What, need, what do we need to be thinking about for in utero? What do we need to be thinking about during childhood? And then, you know, what do we need to be thinking about in adulthood? And I'll try to go through this quickly so we have a little bit of time for discussion. But, you know, if you look at this, you look at this graphic, the lung development, a lot of it happens during um, late phases of pregnancy, but it's not over when a child delivers. We all know that uh, a lot of times lungs have not finished uh, development, which is why respiratory distress syndrome is so common. We also are having unprecedented numbers of preterm births, particularly in the United States. Um, and then we also forget that lungs are actually still developing probably until people's mid-20s. So, you know, we al allow people to smoke earlier than that here in the United States, but those lungs really aren't, aren't um, have not finished developing. And so I think at some point we, you know, our ability to care for preterm infants has gotten better to prevent respiratory disease, but we have way more preterm infants than we ever had before. If you look at the rates of preterm births in the United States relative to other similar westernized countries like Canada and the UK, we have a lot of preterm first. So it'll be, I, I don't know what the future will hold, but I think it's definitely something we have to think about. We have a reasonable amount of in utero nicotine exposure. It, it varies depending on where you are uh, in the world, but I, I pulled this up because um, Missouri is on there specifically and definitely is at the higher end, unfortunately. Michigan usually doesn't do too well with smoking either. Uh, so uh, but one of the interesting things is even though babies are not smoking, the nicotine actually causes the development of long tortuous airways, which then uh, can um, set that childhood child up for wheezing and uh, development of obstructive lung diseases. Interestingly, there is some data such that, uh, well, obviously women shouldn't smoke, but vitamin C supplementation may actually help to mitigate some of those impacts. When we think about childhood, there's been so much data that's been published in the last few years, uh, talking of, just showing that the, that the trajectory of lung function when you look at birth to adulthood is just massively, wildly different. Just like, I mean, think, you know, I'm a, I'm a mom, my son is, is uh, nine, and every time I've taken him to the pediatrician since he was born, I obsess about those growth curves. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not the only parent, uh, but, but you know, you're like, is he tracking? Is he not tracking? Uh, but we never look, but, but just imagine we never look at lung function to figure out if our children are tracking or not tracking. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can be doing proactively to protect the respiratory health of children, breastfeeding, immunizations. There's a lot of work uh, to try to come up with RS, RSV treatments as well as uh, vaccinations, air pollution. Uh, is a big one. It's one that we, I think as lung doctors, even though we should be talking about this a lot, uh, we tend to be quiet and, and we don't make a lot of noise, but we should be talking about this more. Um, it, it, you know, again, lungs don't really hit peak, peak development until their mid-20s. So, uh, 
So trying to keep children away from air pollution to the extent that we can is really, really important. One of the um, interesting things, there's a lot of data that's been generated in the last few years about just where schools are located and schools that are, are, are near freeways, for instance, are gonna, uh, children are gonna have higher uh, episodes of, of wheezing and asthma exacerbations and even lung function impairment that then improves when children are moved, uh, when those schools are, are moved away from high traffic areas. There's been um, uh, pushes for um, an, you know, having anti-idling policies uh, at school. Um, there's also a lot of sources, uh, kind of hidden sources of indoor air uh, pollution as well, things like VOC paints and um, radon, which is the second leading cause of lung cancer in the US. Uh, wood burning stoves actually have been associated with uh, development of COPD. And I have to admit, I have not been very good about talking to my own patients about all of these hidden risk factors in their home. This is the one of these that's made a lot of noise lately. I, probably most of you ended up hearing about this at some point in the last few months. But even things like gas stoves, which have actually been shown to be associated with increased risk for childhood asthma, even if the gas, there's even evidence of uh, you know, increased uh, particulate matter in the home, even when the stove is turned off. So it, it, it's, it's, there's, there's, you know, it, it's a little bit of a mystery, but, um, but you know, I think it just does raise the awareness for all of us that these are real risk factors and things we probably need to be paying a lot more attention to. Uh, childhood respiratory health and secondhand tobacco smoke. So roughly 40% of US children aged three to 11 are exposed to some form of secondhand uh, smoke. You can kind of see the graphs here of where, where we sit relative, uh, relative uh, to other countries. But again, this is, this is something else that we uh, absolutely have to be uh, paying attention to and, and to try to protect our children from. I mentioned at the beginning uh, of the lecture where this kind of all started, which was with the youth vaping crisis. It uh, definitely hasn't left us. So in the US in 2015, roughly a quarter of high school students and 7% of middle school students had used some form uh, of uh, tobacco product. And in 2019, uh, roughly 25% of, of, of youth had reported um, using uh, vaping products at some point. Point. And it's been extremely frustrating for me that the FDA has been very, very slow to regulate this space to the detriment of our children. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I know that, that uh, Washington University participates in this, but the American Lung Association has been working on to, with, uh, in conjunction with the National Institutes of Health to develop a new uh, lung health cohort. Finally, kind of sort of like the Framingham that we haven't had for lung disease. And we're bringing in 25 to 35 year olds and getting CT scans on them, which is a group of people we would never normally be getting CT scans on. And I have been absolutely shocked about the number of phone calls that I have had to make to patients and you know, with abnormalities that otherwise look like early smoking changes. And I've been calling these patients and I've been getting all sorts of interesting stories about things that they're breathing in from vaping to marijuana. Also vastly understudied much higher use, particularly smoked marijuana than we've ever seen uh, before. And I think, I, I think we really, really underestimate the long-term uh, impacts. This is sort of where I spend the majority of my time talking to patients about how to protect their lungs in adulthood. But I think one of my mantras since the pandemic has been, think about, think about your lungs just sort of like you know, your hands. You're gonna get your hands dirty, you go and you protect them with gloves and, or you, you know, wash them. We don't really have those options. Uh, with our lungs. And I think honestly, one of the good things that's come from the pandemic is that people have masks, they're wearing them. And I think they should think about wearing them a lot more often when they're doing, you know, cleaning up spills, et cetera, thinking about things um, within the home or within the workplace. I mentioned that uh, at Michigan, we're starting to get CT scans on kind of early uh, and, and, and middle-aged adults, unlike we'd ever done through several different studies. And um, this is just some examples of some of the things that I am seeing on these CT scans from you know, gas trapping, which indicates uh, early small airways disease to respiratory bronchiolitis um, to early emphysema. I want to end with um, two slides focusing on the social disparities that surround uh, lung disease. Again, this is one of the reasons why I went into pulmonary medicine uh, in the first place and it continues to weigh on me. And it's one of the reasons why I decided to do, to focus on COPD. 
uh, because uh, if you look at where the patients with COPD live, they often live in rural areas and, and in broad strokes, they tend to be socioeconomically disadvantaged relative to other, um, other uh, diseases. So on this graph, you can kind of see physically where a lot of the patients with COPD, it's, I mean, this is the Appalachia belt. Um, and then, you know, in terms of where they live, it's rural, so they have less access to healthcare. And um, in terms of, in terms of uh, income, they tend to be in the lowest quartiles. The other place that this really became uh, evident for me and really struck home was looking at who was dying from COVID-19. So here in, in where I live in, in Michigan, black residents make up roughly 14% of the Michigan population, but they experienced 43% of our COVID-19 uh, related deaths and were 3.6 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than their white counterparts. And, and while we don't fully understand all of the reasons, and some of this may have to do with, with poor access to healthcare uh, ahead of time, underlying lung disease that may have been underdiagnosed or untreated before the pandemic, um, we also, this is data from the University of Michigan that, that we published also demonstrated that the pulse oximeters that we use on these patients in the ICU probably also were not um, uh, uh, picking up accurately among patients um, with darker skin. So not, uh, in, not only is this, uh, you know, this, this problem of undiagnosed or underdiagnosed lung disease pervasive, I think there's also uh, it's also hitting our socioeconomically disadvantaged and, and uh, racial and ethnic minority groups even harder than it has the general population. The last, I think almost uh, last slide I have is I spent the whole talk talking about sort of what the problems are and what, and sort of defense, how do we play defense? But I do have one slide on offense. And that is what, you know, what can we be talking to our patients about in terms of how do we be proactive into trying uh, to prevent against lung disease? And we definitely need more data in this arena. But, but one of the interesting studies uh, that has come out was um, published by a, a good colleague of, uh, and friend of mine at Northwestern, Ravi Callahan's group. And they looked at this, uh, this uh, uh, cohort study called Cardia. But what they found was uh, when they had young adults sort of in their 35-ish age range and then followed them for the next 30 years or so, that people with high baseline fitness had the highest levels of lung function going into later adulthood, and people that maintained or increased those baseline fitness levels did even better. Now, it may be that uh, because we need muscles to, to do the blowing that required with spermidine, it may be that they just had stronger muscles from being more active. Uh, but there is some thought that it could also be that exercise is having an anti-inflammatory component and it may actually be heading off uh, some of some uh, early lung uh, inflammation and may have a protective uh, effect. So just, you know, just to kind of wrap up here for a, a moment, I, I think our, our lungs collectively were on fire before the pandemic even started. And I think what the pandemic has done is sort of to uncover an Achilles heel that was already there. And I think, uh, you know, while obviously every, every health problem is important, I think um, lung health screening for lung disease um, and, uh, and, you know, developing treatments has to become much, much greater of a national priority than it ever has in the past, and I'll just end with this, which was the ending to my book. And I, I think we need to, to recognize the warning signs of lung injury much earlier, and that spirometry is not just a test of lung health, but rather of human health. It is the fifth vital sign. So with that, I'll end. I really needed to show this. That was a great talk. Thanks so much. I think we have time for some questions. Maybe I'll start. You, you mentioned, you know, difficulty with access to uh, spirometry and PFTs, and sort of that relates to insurance and whether it gets paid for and you know uh, accessibility. So, are there other potential quick and dirty sure. or, or more accessible means for assessing lung function earlier? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been working on a variety of things. So, like, I've been involved in a study called Capture. Uh, which uh, combines uh, questionnaires along with like a peak expiratory flow 
to try to identify uh, people who could then move on to spirometry so that we could do some kind of a much better job with um, mass population-based screening. But I do think that this is a space that's really ripe for disruptive technologies. So there are people that are currently working on figuring out if you could talk into your iPhone or blow into your, you know, your, your smartphone uh, to figure out if there is, is some level of lung dysfunction. And I, I do think that we're ultimately gonna have to kind of turn this back over to the masses, much in a way we've done like with blood pressure, anybody can go and buy a, a blood pressure cuff. But even these, like, like I said, micro spirometers, peak expiratory flow probably are, um, you know, relatively well correlated with, with pulmonary function. I think it's very difficult and I will include myself in this group. Uh, and I'm looking out for all the other pulmonologists in the audience. It's very difficult for us to let go because we're so wed, wed to the, the perfectness of, of spirometry and how accurate it is. But I, I, I do think that there, there are, you know, it's under investigation. I think there are opportunities to kind of spread this out to the masses and do mass screening on a better, in a better way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, so there are a couple of things, and actually my thinking on this is changing a little bit now that we're recruiting all these young people that I had never had access to before, and I'm seeing different kinds of abnormality. So what I'm seeing in sort of the 50 to 60 crowd that is we know ultimately results in COPD is uh, evidence of small airways disease, and we can pick that up. Um, we have a method that we developed at Michigan, but you need the expiratory CT scan and we're looking for non-emphysematous gas trapping. So that is um, that in combination, even with very small amounts of emphysema has been shown to be very predictive of the development of COPD. In the younger individuals, what I'm seeing more of are changes um, like ground glass, like central lobular nodules, respiratory bronchiolitis. And there definitely is, it's funny, I've been combing back through the literature, there's definitely some evidence to suggest that, that those kinds of areas can ultimately um, become COPD, but it's a patient population we haven't really studied nearly as well. But you do bring up a really good point that one of the things that's been brought up into, in terms of how can we better screen is we're getting a lot of lung cancer screening CT scans now, right? So how can we better leverage that? You know, the uh, first paper, at least that I'm aware of, that was published on this topic was from 2011 in JAMA, and they showed that, you, you know, based on like BMI and smoking history and, and how much emphysema was on a lung cancer screening CT, you could predict with, you know, reasonable certainty who might have COPD. But we haven't done anything with it. We are now doing a lot of lung cancer screening, but we aren't systematically analyzing that information. And we don't have, you know, I've been talking to, you know, radiology groups and things. We don't have great guidance to give the radiologists for like, you know, for they, we want to be told what to do, right? Send this patient for spirometry, you know, like what is that threshold? I would say personally, I think emphysema 5% or more pretty reasonable likelihood that patient could have uh, COPD. But I, that, I think that that is an area we really need to push on is to find practical ways to implement those. It, it's funny that we're in this position where we're not getting spirometry, but we're getting a lot of CT scans. So all these CT scans that are being done for various reasons, we need to do a better job of, of systematically looking at them and giving our radiologists some guidance on, you know, when to push this back to the clinicians and saying, this is a warning you should be thinking about spirometry. One of the elephants in the room is cigarette smoking. Despite 30 plus years of education and drug development and that kind of thing, um, it continues to be a problem worldwide. Um, why is it a problem? Um, what can we do about nicotine addiction and moving forward? Uh, what needs to change? Yeah, I, I, I wish I had the answer to all of these questions. We would have them have them solved. But I think what you're suggesting, and I would completely agree with, is that we you know, we have been kind of, you know, picking at different parts of this problem. And if we really want to kind of, you know, kind of crack this net more globally, lung health and including smoking cessation at a government level, it's got to be a top priority in terms of regulation. Um, 
Unfortunately, particularly with the advent, there's actually a lot of arguing even within the pulmonary community about the pros and cons of electronic nicotine devices and whether they're good for some people because it gets them off of smoking versus are they a gateway for our youth into then switching over to traditional tobacco products. Uh, but I think tighter, you know, it, it's got to be a national priority. We've got to have tighter uh, regulation. The problem with a, with a lot of what we've got going on now with our youth uh, is that uh, a lot of the electronic nicotine products are very have very very high levels of nicotine and are going to 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 make individuals much more addicted in ways we haven't even seen. So I I fear that the problem is actually uh, getting uh, getting worse. So you know, short I I think it's gonna it's gonna require government stricter government regulation to actually see see something happen. I mean, what, so one of the things I, you know, I, I don't know that anyone's come to a consensus yet, but I've been talking to both the American Thoracic Society leadership about this, as well as the Gold Committee. You know, we don't like to do things without like evidence, but or at least evidence that this very specific intervention has a very specific outcome, but it has been discussed and I'm considering really pushing for it is just that everybody should get a PFT when they're 18, uh, you know, or when they get their driver's license, at least one check in, you know, late adolescence, early adulthood to give you some sense of, you know, did you hit adulthood with those really healthy lungs and fine, it's okay for you to take some risks or, or, you know, you actually, uh, didn't win the lottery and you you know there actually were a lot of things that you may not be aware of and this is something that needs to be looked at I, I, I there is not necessarily a push for that but it's definitely something that I have started to suggest among different groups that we may have to just move to something like that if we really want to attack the screen problem oh picture oh okay 